Hello, everyone. It's Matt Pfeiffer from Supplier Community, and we are here today for another episode of Conversations on Retail. And we are here with uh, my friend, and I and I say friend because Andy and I have enjoyed a very friendly relationship over the last many years. Uh, Conversations on Retail is an opportunity to get to know people that we've had interaction with and inspired us, but to be quite honest with you, as people that we, we really don't know. And uh, I wanted to use this opportunity, as I have with other folks in the past, to to really get to know Andy better, this person that I've, I've known for probably a dozen years now and had tremendous respect for uh, based on the things that he's accomplished. But what we normally do, Andy, is we, we start by talking about you know, childhood and upbringing. Sure. And the purpose for that is to, to really kind of get to the, the, the human being that you are today and, and what has motivated you and driven you and where did, the, where did passion come from? So uh, Andy, if you would just introduce yourself just really briefly, and I wanna kind of get into some questions. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, look, I mean, uh, uh, my name is Andy Wiseman, as you said. <laughs> I've lived in Bentonville now for uh, since 2004. So uh, it's it's been terrific. It's home. It's great. Grew up in the Pacific Northwest, um, you know, and, and I think uh, obviously uh, was brought here to work with Walmart um, on a supplier team many years ago. And it really kind of uh, was a pivotal moment when I came here. But yes, I have a, a background in retail as well, even before that, you know, as a merchandiser from from one of my earliest jobs. And and I'm glad to be here hanging out with you. Well, thank you again for making the time to do this. So I want to start by, by talking about your upbringing. And, and you, you grew up in Oregon, your dad was a, a pastor, kind of talk about, you know, childhood, and what were some of the early influences? What was what were some of the things that were important to you uh, as a kid? And, and what was that early, early stage of your life like? <clears throat> Yeah, my dad was a pastor in the Pacific Northwest, which made my mom a pastor's wife and me a pastor's kid. And, <laughs> and we, we uh, lived in smaller communities all across uh, Oregon, Northern California, Washington, ultimately kind of landed in Oregon and stayed there uh, for many years. And I think, uh, you know, we relocated two or three times, um, four or five times maybe uh, as I was growing up. Every, every two or three years, it seems like. And, you know, in doing that, it, there were some difficulties. It was kind of tough, um, you know, leaving a set of friends and going to a new school and, and all of that as a, as a young guy. But, um, you know, I think in a lot of ways, there were positives that came from that. Um, ultimately, as I uh, grew into adulthood and into my early career, you know, relocating for an opportunity didn't seem so scary. I think dealing with ambiguity in in work or whatever situations having grown up uh used to change and and new scenery and new schools and things like that over the years i think helped me as well um deal with a comfort level related to risk uh, and new opportunity and and so it was good and my parents as you might imagine being very conservative instilled in me a, a great work ethic i think and um, that has helped me all throughout my career whether i was working uh, for somebody else working for a partner for myself or for clients, it's um, it's something that's really helped me. I'm very grateful for that. And and you know, looking back, as hard as moving around was, uh, and as difficult as the expectations were, being a pastor's kid, I think those were good things for me. I know that art and then music were a big part of your childhood. Was that kind of your way of coping with having a new set of friends all the time? Was that your was that your consistency? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how the music thing came around. I started listening to, uh, you know, rock and roll um, and, and ultimately punk music, punk rock and a lot of edgier stuff and speed metal and all the stuff that was on the edge in the in the in the 80s, mid to late 80s, especially uh, developed a real affinity for that kind of music. And it was um, as I had angst and I was a teenager growing up, I, I think I identified with, with the sound and the speed and the energy. Um, and, and I got into it. I started playing, playing on my own and practicing and learning songs and creating things. And yeah, I found friends that also played music. And, and that was a, a very cool period of time in my early 20s, late teens and early 20s. But it's also something you kind of carried ahead. I mean, you're still you're still a very musical person, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I don't really do it professionally. Um, yeah, you know, and even back then, we did it quote unquote professionally. We would we would go on tours, uh, typically regional, sometimes national, but they were relatively short lived. I think the longest was about five weeks. We had a record deal with a an independent label that was pretty notable in Seattle, and and they helped support recordings and and touring. 
I don't have any of that anymore, obviously, but yeah, I still, uh, I still do play the guitar, um, have uh, enjoyed um, kind of just creating uh, as sort of a pastime or a way to create things for myself or others that I love. So I still do, yeah, I still do create music and record once in a great while and enjoy it a great deal. So childhood, college, where, where did you, where'd you go to college and what'd you study? <laughs> no college, no study. I mean, I went, I went straight into the workforce out of school um, and really music was my career at the time that, uh, you know, I, I could have been dedicating hours to, to college. It wasn't a career in terms of, um, you know, paying the bills, but it was, it was my focus for about 10 years. And so um, that, that's, uh, I learned a lot of lessons, you know, through those years. And, you know, I'm sure I learned a lot, um, at work, learned a lot about retail, learned, you know, as a merchandiser at the time, um, ultimately a, a junior sales guy and, and et cetera. But I learned a lot dealing with people through the course of being in the music business as well. You know, how to how to lead effectively and ineffectively because I've made my share of leadership mistakes over the years like anybody else. Those were good times, but no, no college. Um, and uh, of course it's contrary to what I tell my own kids today, you know, <laughs> who either have finished college or are in college, you know, I, I do think an education is important. Um, but for me, it, it was a, a something that I didn't, I didn't choose to do. Yeah, which is which is ironic. And this isn't about me, but I'm just the opposite. I went to college and wish I wouldn't have. I wish I would have yeah. just, you know, I, I've known since I was 10 years old that I wanted to kind of have this entrepreneurial journney. And it took me until I was you know, 32 to have the courage to yeah. break, break away from a great gig at Walmart to, to, to begin to enjoy that. So it's, it's yeah. interesting how everybody kind of has a different perspective based on their own experience. Yeah. So tell me, tell me about the, the position that you had uh, in Oregon that ultimately led you to Northwest Arkansas. How did you, how did you come by that position? How did you grow in that position? And, and how did you end up with this opportunity to, to relocate? Yeah, I mean, I uh, I started my real first real job, I would say, outside of working at a Pace membership warehouse, which was ultimately bought by Sam's Club. Uh, right. Was, I didn't I didn't know that. How long were you at Pace? Uh, I was at Pace uh, two and a half, three years. Okay. You know, after working at McDonald's, like every kid does or right. should. And it went to work for a merchandising company called PIA Merchandising. Hmm. It was based in California and had a sa uh, sales or merchandising territory. Really, it wasn't sales uh, initially, and and ran around the beautiful state of Oregon doing uh, planogram resets at, at Rite Aid drugstores, Fred Meyer and some others, and, and really began to love merchandising, um, assorting product, doing resets. Uh, and then it, it sort of uh, evolved into promotions of sorts where I began to sell to independent grocers there on the, on the, grocery, on the grocery floor and cut things in and cut the competitors out and, and began to really enjoy that. Uh, and then that company uh, provided opportunity for me to move to uh, a great fishing tackle manufacturer called Pure Fishing, oh, okay. uh, where I worked for about six and a half years. My boss at PIA went to work at Pure Fishing. I was fortunate to be taken along with him and uh, developed a sales territory across Oregon and Washington, was moved to uh, beautiful Albuquerque selling tackle in the desert, hmm. uh, which was ironic, grew that territory uh, that grew to an opportunity in Colorado, and then ultimately was recruited uh, to join the Walmart sales team at Pure Fishing. And, and I, I, I really enjoyed that a lot. And that's how I landed in Bentonville. That's kind of my retail story. Yeah. And how long were you with Pure Fishing altogether? I think about six years. Okay. Yeah. And, and once you came to Bentonville, how long were you on that team, on the, on the, on the Walmart couple, team? Uh, just under a couple of years. Um, okay. Yeah. And then the tra transition from there to MGA, what, what did that look like? How did you end up in yeah. the toy business? I wasn't looking for a job uh, at all. I loved uh, the business that I was running at Pure Fishing. Um, it was on the uh, cusp of a number of launches that we were uh, initiating and so there was a lot of opportunity to really grow the business there and it was growing and it was it was fun to kind of have a very needy business to manage uh, for a very good company with some very strong brands but i was approached by mga as they were growing through this explosive opportunity with brats dolls yeah. which in uh, the early 2000s was an enormous success right and they needed some help and so i was asked to join the sales team and uh 
was given a variety of responsibilities. And, and I, I thought that, wow, this is an opportunity to learn a very new category uh, and to, to sort of develop, develop my career and, and skills in, in, in a new way. And so I took the opportunity and it was, it was, a, it was a great ride. So you said the opportunity came came to you. You weren't looking for a different position. How how, how did they find you? How did they know you? Was it a personal <laughs> relationship with someone? Or? Yeah, it was through personal relationship, really. I mean, okay. it was through uh, the husband of the team lead on the business who I had struck up a friendship with, and and we actually skateboarded together and enjoyed okay. that, which is another another great sport and activity I enjoy to do even now. And and he had mentioned that they needed help, and the doors just kind of opened up there and uh, began to talk to. Uh, the team lead about it and and it, uh, you know ultimately found myself in California interviewing with their senior leadership and it was a it's a very cool opportunity for me hmm. and what was that first first position that that you took with them what, what oh. kind of role were you in I was junior sales guy on the totem pole I don't know national account manager I think okay okay so sales responsibility less about analytics and replenishment and those sorts of things yeah. more about the more about the customer relationship so yep. what did you what did you learn at, at, at MGA? I mean, you, yeah. you must have learned an awful lot. I mean, they're kind of kind of still to this day kind of cowboys, right? In the, in the business. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the guy that runs that business, the founder Isaac Larian, is is a creative genius, and right. uh, his brands. I, I, I read I read him on LinkedIn all the time. He's a yeah. definitely a, prov a provocateur. Yeah, I learned a lot <laughs> from him. I mean, I I uh, that was a great opportunity. It stretched me in ways I never would have expected, both from dealing with a, a very unique kind of company culture um, uh, in terms of just kind of uh, the inner workings of the machine there. But also it was a cool opportunity to really get my feet wet in the import business. A lot of what we did was import. I got right. Sam's Club experience at the time and I sold some terrific programs to Sam's Club and uh, uh, learned how there to fill out the awful uh, walmart.com content forms which is mm. something that that they probably were trying to punish me with <laughs> but it was very very good experience i also learned how important speed to market is and how when you have an opportunity a brand that's very strong uh, to uh, not necessarily dictate terms with the customer but to really take that consumer demand and leverage it into big opportunity to win for the company that you work for and for for Walmart and Sam's Club. So it was a terrific, a terrific opportunity to leverage that demand for me. And I learned a lot through that. Yeah. And any failures that you could point to? Any things that, that kind of tripped you up in, in that transition from fishing into toys? And and yeah. I, I would guess that it would be kind of a, a very, and, and I'm guessing completely, but fishing, uh, kind of a, a more established business, maybe a more relaxed culture. And then you step into this very fast paced, high pressure. Uh, it seems like the founder was constantly picking fights with Mattel. It just seems like it might be a completely different yeah. culture. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the mistakes that I made was getting with the pace of things at first. I wouldn't call it a mistake, but maybe a challenge because you're right. If you're fishing uh, a stable $250 million business at the time, year over year globally, uh, a very uh, uh, a stoic business run very much like a standard CPG group and, and, and a bunch of smart, experienced people were running that business. It was domestically supplied to Walmart. It was a well-oiled machine. And if you were throwing down a five or 10% growth, you were a hero. Uh, in the toy business, it's very, very different. And at that time at MGA, things were exploding. Uh, the business was well over $500 million, as mm. I recall, globally. And, and how, how, before, how yeah. long did it take to get there? How old was the company at that point? How old was MGA or Pure MGA, uh, MGA. I really don't know. I mean, Isaac started out as Micro Games of America, I believe in okay. the very late eighties or early nineties. Um, okay. so, so the business was, had been around for quite a while and this was okay. Isaac's first explosive hit, but mm -hmm. but he he had been around for a while in the toy okay. business and had some success with handheld games and other things. Okay, interesting. So the culture was obviously very different. How long, yeah. how long were you there and, and how, how did your uh, roles and responsibility change over that period of time? I was there for just shy of two years. Um, okay. And uh, roles and responsibilities didn't change a lot, but the product line sure did. So, you know, mm -hmm. as we received uh, other opportunities with other licenses, whether it was Shrek or, or, or Little Tykes ultimately, which we bought at the time, um, you know, there were, there were a lot of new opportunities thrown my way all the time.
to to uh, to take and run with. And so that was an exciting exciting challenge. It's always something new. It wasn't uh, an annual sales meeting at Pure Fishing, for example, where we'd have an annual meeting and we'd look at new items and we'd go out and we'd get the business once a year and yeah. maybe look for some future business. This business was always, always running, always changing. How big, how big a team did you have at the time, roughly? I think there were five or six of us on the business in Bentonville, okay. uh, maybe four or five in Bentonville and two or three in Van Nuys that were supporting Walmart directly. Okay. Okay. Relatively small team considering the size and the trajectory. Correct. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. 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 No, that's great. So after those two years, did, did the next opportunity come looking for you or, or were you ready to do something different? Yeah, I had an opportunity to go to work for a, a young company called Sepia, which was uh, developed and built by another uh, very iconic uh, guy named Russell Hornsby, who is another genius in his own right, very creative, uh, uh, a guy who's developed his own hit product lines over the years, uh, multiple times, uh, ultimately developed Trendmaster, which was the company that was the predecessor for Sepia into about a $250 million company that he sold to Jack Specific. So I, uh, I joined their team and, and, uh, and that was, I think, early 2007 and uh, with responsibilities on Walmart and Sam's Club and that, that grew and developed over time. And how, how big was that company compared to what you had left at MGA? Yeah, well, the business at, at Sepia was very small. It was, uh, I think we were about a $25 million business at the time okay. um, and at retail, maybe 50 million globally. And uh, what had, mo what had motivated your desire to, to make the change? Were, yeah. were... Well, I wish I could say it was my, my desire to change. I, mm -hmm. I, uh, the, the company bought little tykes, uh, MGA okay. did and in that buyout, um, had inherited a bunch of senior salespeople that had a lot more experience and tenure than I did. Um, and they were, you know, brought into the Walmart team. And so my position was eliminated. Okay. I was very, very fortunate though, because Sepia called me and I ended up being my last day of the job at MGA was 1231. And my first day was January 1st at Sepia. Um, the transition was very smooth and quite remarkable. And it was a very neat opportunity. And how long were you at Sepia? Uh, I was there for a little over three years. Uh, okay. and and that was an incredible ride. Yeah, similar roles and responsibilities, a uh, cu couple of great products, right? Well, it started out similar. Yeah, I was managing the Walmart business, Walmart and Sam's, and uh, was given Toys R Us uh, as well. So I began to travel out to Wayne, New Jersey, and mm -hmm. call on them, which was a, a very cool expansion of my responsibilities, a customer right. that was just very, very fun to call on at the time. Um, and, and they were hungry for business. And so it was exciting to, to have that new responsibility. And then after about a year and a half, I was promoted to GM and uh, relocated to St. Louis and worked at the corporate headquarters reporting to the CEO. And uh, that, that was an unbelievable experience in many ways. And we launched the famous Zuzu Pets brand um, which was, it ultimately became a $2 billion retail brand uh, mm. in just three short years. And so that, that was crazy. And it was, it was a brand we could not get anybody to believe in. Toys R Us was going to buy about three or 4,000 pieces. Uh, Walmart was buying uh, a very small amount in a tiny store account. We tested it, it blew up and it became, became just a, 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 an enormous success very quickly. So did you find yourself falling in love with the toy category the more you were there or was it, you just happened, happened to be in it? Yeah, I know. And, and, and I asked ask that because as you, be, I just, I'm curious about when you began to daydream about breaking away and starting your mm -hmm. own business yeah. in the toy category. I think what I love about it still to this day is that it's uh, a business that's so creative and mm -hmm. Nothing has really changed since the earliest days uh, for me back in 2005 when I began in this industry. I mean, you put together something creative, you develop uh, some decent prototypes, maybe a works like prototype and a looks like prototype, and you take it to the world's largest retailers and you cast a vision as to what it's going to be. And, and sometimes you're successful, a lot of times you're not. And I think that fast paced kind of create, present, drive um, 
uh, kind of process is very exciting. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And I, I began, I guess, to think about doing that after, um, you know, watching the success of, of Isaac with Bratz, um, learning uh, from Russell so much about how to develop and launch product. Um, and, and I began to kind of hunger to do that on my own. I've always had an entrepreneurial bug and always uh, wanted to sort of chart my own course um, and, and develop and launch my own product. In fact, and that goes back to my days at Pure Fishing when I would work with our marketing people to develop and introduce concepts that we had sketched out on paper in Bentonville. And so uh, love, love that part of the toy business. Yeah. So when did you begin daydreaming about Redwood? What would become Redwood Ventures? Was it while you were at MGA? Was it while you were at Sepia? I don't remember the exact time. Um, I'm sure it, I, I would say it was probably at Sepia. Okay. Um, you know, as I began to kind of wonder if I could do this myself. You know, I, I remember thinking that Isaac and, and Russell, if they can do it, I, I might be able to do it as well. And, and I, I found that sometimes I could. Sometimes I couldn't, maybe a lot of times I couldn't do what they do. They're, those uh, those two are, are remarkable in their own right. But um, I, I began to think that way and and began to put together sort of a plan to go and, and do that and, and ultimately did in 2010. Did you have some ideas in mind at the time for what the toys would look like? Or was it just, I want to start an organization that develops these types of products and then we'll kind of figure out what those products look like down the road? Yeah, well, the toy business is all about product. Mm -hmm. and, and having something that could work. I, I would say the two kind of began together. I mean, I, I, I realized uh, that we had to have a great product line if we were going to create great, a great company. And so the two happened about at the same time. And, uh, um, you know, you, you've got to have the, the bread and butter. And that's, that's amazing product as you're developing a business plan. And so our earliest business plans included plans to launch and develop a very specific toy line when we started, but uh, that was always viewed as just an initial opportunity, an initial brand launch. And, and, and really the goal was always to uh, have multiple brands uh, on shelf at any given time and, and continuously develop uh, both strategically and opportunistically new opportunities, new brands. Yeah. So I, I, I told you, I knew I've known since I was 10 years old that I wanted to start and, and run businesses. And it took me until I was 32 to figure out what, what that business would look like. But, you know, I worked for Walmart at the time. I had just completed an expat assignment in Japan and, and Walmart was a company that, I, th I think this is still true. There was just no tolerance whatsoever for uh, any sort of side hustle. So I was very open uh, about my intention to, to, uh, to, to do something um, and, uh, uh, long story endless, I ended up going to work for another company for a year while I was working on my side hustle evenings and, and weekends and, and mm -hmm. early mornings. And after that full year, I went into it full time. So I'm, I'm curious with that in mind, what did your transition mm -hmm. from full time employee to full time entrepreneur yeah. look like? Was it evenings and weekends and doodling and talking to investors and building the team and partners abroad? And what, what did it look like? No, I mean, I got bought out of my contract at Sepia and took took some time to develop a business plan, plan raise funding, find partners. And so there was a cold, hard stop for me, mm -hmm. um, which enabled me to completely focus on developing that plan. So you say bought out. So you had you had partners and, and venture capital. Well, no, I, you know, I, I wish I, I'm t I'm, I don't want to confuse Redwood with with Sepia. At Sepia, I had a, a contract and I basically ended that contract and took the time and proceeds from what was left in that to go ahead and, I and uh, prepare the, the plans to launch Redwood. I see. OK, that makes sense. Yeah. So was it was it only you? Was there a team of people? Yeah, initially it was me and and uh, uh, another coworker from Sepia joined me eventually after he left, he was gonna go into retirement, a mentor and, and an, an older gentleman from the toy business. And and we sort of partnered up and uh, and went and found some additional partners, some kind of funding partners and, and scratched and put the business together. I think he planned to retire, but uh, has the entrepreneurial bug himself and then was happy to jump in with me as a young whippersnapper and, and we put together a plan and ran with it 
And what were those first months and, and, and even years like between formation of the organization mm -hmm. and launching your first product? And was that launch a success? The first months uh, and maybe the first couple of years were uh, both more emotionally satisfying and, and more frightening than anything I think I've ever experienced at work. Mm -hmm. You know, as I jumped out on my own, there was really no safety net. Um, and and the failures that we launched were going to be mine completely. Mm -hmm. And the success would be mine in a shared sense. And so um, it was exhilarating to establish a company culture. That was, that was a thrill. And in the early days, I would say the culture that we built was, was terrific. It was, it was strong. It was focused on, on the customer um, and some values that, that I had taken with me or developed over the years from, from great companies like Pure Fishing, especially that I had worked for. And so I had a great time developing all of that and building it and sort of uh, planting, planting the seeds for what, what Redwood would become and, and really enjoyed that. But as we developed and launched our first product line, we failed dramatically mm -hmm. with it. Um, we had focus grouped it with some very smart former Mattel executives some of who I, I stay in contact with these days, some very brilliant people. And as we, uh, as we failed, we began to question everything. Well, our focus group's worth it. You know, should we continue as a business? I knew we needed to continue as a business, but there were those uh, that were partners of ours that wondered if we should. Uh, and, and we did, uh, because we knew that we could do it again and, and, and again, and we could be successful with other launches. And so ultimately, I, I spent about 10 years uh, building Redwood into the business that it, that it is, and it, it still is today. And that was a terrific experience. Yeah. What were some of the highlights in terms of the products that were, mm -hmm. were developed yeah. and the successes they, they had at Walmart and other retailers? Yeah. Our first big success was the Little Fishies brand, which was a line of aquatic pets and play sets that we did very well with. And we had to claw, scrape, and fight for everything with that. But it became a very successful branded and we sold millions and millions of pieces uh, all over the world and uh, at Walmart here at home. And, and I'm guessing made, I'm guessing made great money in the process. Yeah, it was good. It was a, it was a high margin product. Uh, velocity was very good at retail. Anytime it went out, we had MCAP programs at the time at Toys R Us that ran year over year for three or four years in a row. Uh, it uh, became a doll brand as well. That doll brand remained on shelf at Walmart uh, as late as uh, about 24 months ago. So uh, it was certainly a legacy brand for us and something that, that did very well. It's something that uh, still could be on shelf and do well. And I'm sure you'll see it again soon. That's a great brand. And, and that, that taught me that, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, really defining a product um, in a way that could appeal broadly to kids, boys and girls in a broad age sense with a lot of different play patterns was very important. That was our first success. Yeah. And, and what, so when I first reached out to you about having this conversation, I didn't, I didn't realize, and, and you have subsequently reminded me a couple of times you're no longer at Redwood. I didn't realize yeah. that. What, what drove the decision and what did that transition out, you know, look like? Did you, did you sell the business? Did you, I mean, what, yeah. what can you share about that? Sure. Yeah. You know, we we developed a number of successes uh, at, at Redwood. We also developed a number of failures and that's the nature of any toy business. And um, we grew ultimately to a business that, that was about $120 million at retail. And we were completely virtual. So I had partners in Hong Kong, a partner in Minnesota. There was me, I ran the business from here in Bentonville and we had a team of designers and creatives and engineers uh, across the country. And, uh, you know, a, a, as we grew and experienced some of the success that, that the I do 3D, 3D drawing brand brought us and, and ultimately Smushy Mushy, which was our biggest brand, um, we needed to grow to the next level to go from being a up and coming uh, small toy company to a stable mid-size company. And there were just differences that the partners that I had brought into the business and I had in terms of strategy and how we uh, foresaw the business going forward. And so, you know, those things uh, were contentious at times, even though I think ultimately we wanted the same things for the business. We, we had different, uh, different plans for the business to get there. And so uh, about a year and a half ago, I took my part of the business uh, and moved on 
And, uh, and so you know, that's, that's kind of how things happen. And, and I, I would say that the company still exists and, uh, and hopefully will be very successful for many years to come. Yeah, yeah. Based on what you know now, in, including kind of this last 12 months of, of COVID and how it's changed yeah. so much uh, about, about the way you know, we, we shop and consume and what would you have done differently? Uh, assume, uh, if you were to assume that you would still be involved in Redwood today, what would you have done in the early days of, of, of founding that business to have uh, you know, prepared the business to in, in, endure for this past year and then those yeah. ahead? Yeah, I think I would have invested more in people earlier, earlier yeah. on. Um, you know, we did $120 million at our peak with 13 people. Mm, wow. and, 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 and that, uh, it's a remarkable accomplishment. Although when I compare those numbers with what we did at CPA, we had 15 people when Zuzu Pets was on fire. And so you can do a lot if you're focused uh, and you have a very hot product line. I should have earlier in the business though, established uh, a more foundational creative team, one that can handle kind of the ups and downs of the business, uh, but mostly keep that pipeline even more full than it was. I wish we had invested more in, in creativity and in creative people. Yeah. Any, any other regrets? I mean, again, I, I have never known yeah. you particularly well, but there have been multiple times that I've engaged you say, hey, do you want to do this? Do you want to do this? And it, it just, it's, it felt like it was a very intense, yeah. uh, often uh, period of, of your life and time yeah. was just, I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to call it, call it pressure. Maybe you want to call it pressure, but yeah. what, was there, was it a, a period of a, a season of intense pressure trying to, trying to manage this rapidly growing yeah. business that had hits and failures and, and only 13 yeah. people? It was, I mean, because even before we had those 13 people, there were, there were the years where it was just my partner here in the U S and I and contractors and sales reps around the country. So I was on the road a lot, on the road, a lot on the phone with Hong Kong and China late at night, many times and any regrets, I would say, yes, uh, I have some. And primarily it's that I, I let in many ways that business become, um, uh, you know, kind of the end all for me. I had to spend so much time on it that for those around me that I loved, uh, I didn't have enough time or energy at times. And, and I think yeah. it's a common struggle that, that we all have, um, especially as entrepreneurs and one that I wish I had reined in a little bit earlier, but the business required that in order to grow. So, you know, yeah. in one sense, it was, I had to be there, I had to do it. But if I could go back and do it differently, I probably would have found a way to, to manage that uh, in, in a better way. Yeah, it was all encompassing. And the failures were really tough to manage through, driving the business forward when we were struggling. And then, yeah. you know, when you're very successful as well, like we were with I Do 3D and Smushy Mushy, that brings its own unique pressures to the business and to your, to your yeah. personal life and, and managing through all of that. So people say there are good problems. And I don't really agree with that. You know, you'll hear, well, that's, that's a good problem to have. And yeah, I don't really believe that's the case, but your perspective on those problems and how you manage through and your balance as you go through it is very important. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting to, to think about, you know, my 16 years as an entrepreneur, what you just said a second ago about, I mean, it seems as though maybe the, the best years on paper were some of the hardest years to get through. And, yeah. uh, and, and sometimes it's the tougher, tougher years on paper were a little easier to endure. Talk mm -hmm. about the transition from Redwood now into Lean and Bentonville. Talk about uh, that organization yeah. and your team and, and what you all do. <clears throat> yeah. Well, you know, when I left Redwood, I had uh, puzzled for a while about what to do next. Do I begin a new business um, from scratch, creating toys and other consumer products with the network of connections that I have around the world in, in manufacturing and distribution and et cetera? Or do I take a different direction. And um, I began to talk with the founder of Lean In, who is Heather Ronchetto. And she's mm -hmm. been a very successful uh, business person herself over a, a number of years, a, a buyer at Walmart for about a decade. She ran yeah. a $5 billion p &L when she left there. And, and, then, and then as uh, after that, a very, very successful consultant uh, who helps companies develop and manage businesses at Walmart and Sam's. 
And I began to, uh, to think about what it would be to work with her and, and uh, joined her some, some months back, a little bit more than some months back and, and uh, have really enjoyed it because it's been a transition where uh, I have, it's been very natural, but it's also been an opportunity for me to take the experience that I have, successes, yeah. failures alike, and to uh, sort of work as a guide for, for other businesses that are either uh, looking to open the doors at Walmart or have a business at Walmart that they want to grow. And I've enjoyed that. It's, uh, it's, it's a, a real joy to be uh, working with people who are hungry to grow and to yeah. have a, a, a meaningful way to apply what I've learned uh, through the course of my career and in, in helping people achieve that. Yeah. I was having a conversation with Nathan Spang uh, just the other day from from retail sports marketing. We're talking about kind of the future of retail attainment and it doesn't matter what we were talking about, but I was just talking about how the, the older I get, the more honest I become and, yeah. and the, the less less worried about what other people might think of that honesty. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's been fun kind of becoming the, the wise old men. Right. And uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I imagine you're having a lot of fun in, in that new role. What kinds of, of businesses in terms of, of size, stage, category uh, are, are you working with? Well, first, I wouldn't necessarily call myself wise, but I would call myself old and I definitely feel older every day. <laughs> But we're business. Uh, we're managing businesses that uh, really are, are are widely varied. There are businesses um, in in all sorts of different spaces. Whether it's novelty candy um, or toy, we've got obviously a, a core group of terrific toy brands that we're working with. Some of those toy brands uh, rely on licenses to be relevant. Some of them couple license with innovation. Some of them are outright innovators themselves, uh, mm -hmm. and so. We love the core toy business. That's a business we're very familiar with, but we do business in party. We do business um, in seasonal. We do business in impulse. So we reach really across the box, including sporting goods and beyond. And it's, it's uh, a lot of fun every day to have a focus that's not only multi-buyer, but really multi-category and multi-retail. Yeah. Um, we have the capability of reaching outside of Bentonville and have done so successfully with some lines. Uh, through a network of sales partners that we've developed over the years. And so uh, we're, we're a multifaceted group. We thrive on that variety. Um, and we uh, enjoy mostly the opportunity, I think, to partner with clients in a very strategic sense that want to get together early on before a brand or product is launched and discuss the line in its earliest formative state so that we can you know, add our feedback um, as a team, because we've seen a lot of product over the years, a lot of failures, a lot of successes. And so, um, you know, the businesses that we, we work with are incredibly varied. The ones that we enjoy the most and are most, most effective with are the ones that invite us in early on and really bring us in as collaborative partners. Of all the impacts uh, that have been made as a result of, of COVID, which would you say has been the most profound in terms of how business is done between brand and consumer? Uh, I mean, obviously considering the retailer is as an intermediary, but what, what, is, what has had the most profound impact and, and the, the, will continue to have the most lasting change on the way business is done? Well, there are numerous things we could talk yeah. about, but I, I would say that, um, as it relates to Walmart specifically, we'll just focus on them for a moment. Yeah. Their, their ability to uh, drive the online business has changed forever. And I don't think that will ever change. And it's mm -hmm. given them a boost up in ways that none of us could have foreseen. And their grocery delivery and pickup today opportunities are uh, something that, that people take advantage of now that they never took advantage of before. And so, uh, those, those are things that, that really our clients uh, are thriving on and it's opportunity for all of us. So I think just that's probably the biggest one I can think of. I saw opportunities pop up though in categories at Walmart that we never would have expected, <clears throat> you know, that came out of nowhere and uh, that highlighted the need for speed to shelf. And that's mm. more important than ever. I think that it was a wake up call to a lot of companies uh, that uh, when opportunity arises, we have limited time sometimes to react. 
and to exploit that opportunity, both as retailers and as, uh, and as makers. And it really kind of brought the fast to the forefront with a number of opportunities for us as well. Yeah. I was going to ask you earlier about about mm -hmm. speed and and, mm -hmm. uh, and and I'm not exactly sure how I'd want to ask the question, but just this idea of is is speed to market more of a thing, or is there kind of this mm -hmm. this cautious sort of optimism that's, that's being built in? Uh, I, I was having a conversation with a couple of different people, Scott Huff and, and some others that have been in the business and forgotten uh, more about it than, than I'll ever know, and I was kind of sharing some views about how I think things are going to look going forward and like, no you're you're completely wrong and, and i was kind of had, had this bearish view with respect to in-store promotional activity and, and that sort of thing and uh just uh, what you said about speed to market i i think is key so yeah. the last thing I, last thing i want to talk about is um you know just talk a little bit about you know about who who you are as, as a human being beyond you know what you have done for the last number of years working with in the toy business and the sporting goods business as an entrepreneur and now advising uh supplier teams of of uh you know various size staging categories we mentioned before who who are you what do you want to be what, what do you want to be known for and remembered by yeah that's a that's a tough question first of all i don't know how interesting this really is to anybody <laughs> the question because i i consider myself to be sort of rather unremarkable in a lot of ways, but I want to be remembered as, as a guy who, uh, from a career standpoint, was, uh, was effective and good to work with, and somebody who brought uh, added value to whatever business that I was on at the time in a way that was lasting. And I want people to re remember that I was a lot of fun to work with because, you know, we spend most of our waking hours at work. We've got to enjoy that but we have to provide a return on investment as well. So I want to be known as that guy that drove results, but that had a lot of fun along the way uh, and have built good, good relationships with people that I've worked with and for over the years that, that persist to that day to today. And, and I want to be able to maintain that kind of reputation. Um, and, you know, more importantly though, I, you know, I think by family, I think we want to be remembered all of us as, uh, as as good fathers and and as as um, people who um, really kind of put the kids and family first, and that's a real hard one to do. But that's much more important than what we're remembered for yeah. related to than, than we are to our career. Yeah. What advice would you give someone at the beginning of their career? And I'm I'm tempted to say at the beginning of their entrepreneurial journey, but so few people will ever have that experience that I, I think it would be a, a question yeah. wasted. As you think back to the beginning of, of your career um, with, with your first real job at, at Pure Fishing, what, what advice would you give to someone at the beginning of a career that would look somewhat like, like yours did at the beginning? Yeah, that's tough. I mean, I think we a lot of times get wrapped up in career planning, you know, mm -hmm. kids, kids coming mm -hmm. out of school and getting their first real job, walking in with a corporation and thinking about how's my career going to go or what's my path or even as an entrepreneur, we think, you know, what's next. And there's this term serial entrepreneur, which is grossly yeah. misused by a lot of people. Wow. Um, and, and so I think we've romanticized um, a lot of, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and I think what you got to realize is you're going to fail a ton and you got to be yeah. willing to do that first of all, but yeah. probably the single most important thing that, that I would say contributed to my success and that I think could contribute to any young person's success starting out is to really take on any business that they're working on as if it was their own business. And so whether you're working for Walmart or, uh, or Casey's, whatever, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're, you're there, pretend that you own that business because as you work that way, you'll be rewarded for it. And yeah. over time, you will have learned things and acted in a way that will prepare you for entrepreneurship. And so do that, go the extra mile. And then ultimately when you have your own opportunity to jump out and run your own business, you'll, you'll be more successful because you will have built those kind of career muscles and those reflexes. Yeah. Patience has always been an area that I have have struggled in, and uh, a lack of patience with others, and a lack of patience with yeah. situations, but even more, a lack of patience with myself and an an inability mm. or an unwillingness to blossom where yeah. I've been planted, and yeah. not always be kind of looking ahead to the what's next. And mm. and uh, I wish as a twenty and thirty year old 
uh, I would have been much, much more patient and, and focused on doing the things that I was responsible for in those moments really, really yeah. well, as opposed to constantly looking ahead to the next. That's good. So a little, little, little bit of a tough question maybe, but I, I love this question. Uh, what have you yet to accomplish in any aspect of your life uh, mm -hmm. that motivates you to keep playing the game hard? It could be in your personal life, yeah, in, yeah. in your in your walk, in terms of your faith. It could be in your professional life or some sort of entrepreneurial something that that nags at you, that, that you, you just know you need to do it. I don't know that I can give you a tangible answer to that in terms of I've got to get this done and put a stake in the ground. But one thing yeah. that I think I carry with me from, from what my parents taught me and, and some of the early uh, rewarding experiences I had in the band and the career is that I need to strive to improve all the time. And the desire to, to grow and do more today than I was able to do yesterday, I always have with me. And so if I lose that, I'll definitely have a problem. And I'll, I'll definitely be able to answer your question. Well, I want to get that back. But that's my answer to the question. You know, just that desire in itself, and this might sound a little bit vague, but this desire to continue to improve is something that I've got to hold on to and continue to execute against. Well, Andy Wiseman, it has been great talking with Thanks. you. You you've been you've been really good to me over the years. And and uh, when you know I've asked you to, to speak or I've asked for advice or asked you to help. Uh, another person you've always been super super gracious um toward me and and, and with your time and uh, yeah. you're a guy that i've really looked up to I, i've admired your hustle not having any idea what was going on kind of in inside your mind and inside you know this fortress you're trying to trying to protect protect in, in terms of your business your family but uh mm. I, I really appreciate you making time to visit today and and, uh, and i hope the folks that watch this will gain something from it and yeah, uh, sure. best wishes in this in this new role and i look forward Thank to catching up with you again soon Enjoyed it. Thanks, Matt. Take care.